Bobby, you want to take, <coughs> you want to take these ones? Uh, these are the questions. People can just add more if they like. And uh, these are the ones that have already been answered. So you can, if you want, you can just throw those out, probably. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> we, breakfast is important. It takes a while to get everyone together. <laughs> That's good. Huh? <coughs> is there enough time for breakfast for everyone? Enough time? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because you have to clean up as well. Yeah, so it's got a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know how long it takes to eat breakfast because I get this enormous table, I get all this beautiful food. You can't stop, you have to keep on eating. <laughs> Shall we start? Yeah? Okay, okay, good. Okay, so the um, next sutta is called the Two Kinds of Thought, in Pali the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, found in the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, number 19. And this is one of these uh, autobiographical suttas where the Buddha talks about his own practice before his awakening, what he did to uh, uh, get to the end of the path and how to how he found awakening himself and it's one of those suttas which is interesting in the sense that uh, the buddha talks about his own defilements before his awakening and how you know he had to deal with all the same problems that everyone else has to deal with uh, um, sensuality uh, ill will uh, and these things uh, of course in the case of the buddha he would have had these things fairly weakly otherwise if he had very strong uh, aspects of these hindrances, he wouldn't have been able to reach awakening. So h for him it would have been fairly weak, and that's why he was able to enter jhana as a child and all of these kind of things. Uh, but nevertheless, he still had those defilements. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it's useful to remember that because it kind of uh, reminds us of the humanity of the Buddha. He practiced the same path as us, uh, and when he gives these teachings, uh, the purpose of giving these teachings is to encourage us to practice in the same way. He's giving us the means, the skillful techniques. They sometimes call it the skillful means, the upaya. But uh, that's more like a Mahayana term, but it's, I think it's applicable in Theravada Buddhism as well. The skillful means to overcome these uh, defilements. Uh, and this is what this uh, sutta is about. So again, remember that when the Buddha talks about his own life, it is to inspire us to do the same thing. Uh, he led and we follow after. So, um, and again, we, I've already talk, spoken about the uh, suttas, the uh, mindfulness of breathing uh, before already, so we, we know kind of the terrain, the outline of what is supposed to happen. Uh, and now we move taking a step back, and if, if that process doesn't happen automatically, uh, what is it that we have to do? Uh, yeah, and this is part of that process of what we have to do to be able to uh, make the mindfulness of breathing work, the satipatthana work, and all of these kind of things. So it's like taking a step back uh, to uh, look at the problems and the solutions to the obstacles uh, that uh, get in the way for the process to happen automatically. Uh, this is the, uh, what the two kinds of thoughts is about. And um, so let us... Uh, uh, see what the Buddha has to uh, say about this. So, thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jaita's Grove, Anattapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, bhikkhunis perhaps, lay people, everyone. Huh? Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, before my awakening, uh, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva, a bodhisattva, it occurred to me. Uh, 
Suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. Let me just stop there because um, I want to just briefly again comment on this opening here. This is a very standard opening you find in the suttas. Uh, whenever the Buddha talks about his own life and his own uh, practice, uh, this is usually how he starts out. Before my awakening, pubbe me uh, samboda or something like that. Uh, uh, and again, I just wanted to just reinforce what I mentioned earlier before, that in the uh, Pali Suttas, in the early Suttas, what this means, it does not refer to what it means later on uh, in the more developed tradition. Uh, in the Pali Suttas, it refers to the, uh, what happened after the Buddha goes forth. Uh, the Buddha goes forth from the home life uh, and he decides to search for an end to the problems. Uh, yeah, he realized that there is a problem. We already looked at that, how there is death, how there is old age, and how this actually is a very big problem in human existence, uh, especially if you have to do it again and again and again. Uh. So it is from that realization that there is a problem, and then the going forth, and then uh, the search for awakening. Uh. He doesn't know whether there is awakening at this point. He doesn't know if it's possible. Yeah. So he has to search for it first of all. Uh, and that is why this declaration that I mentioned before, found in the Acharya Bhutta Sutta, Majjhimanika 123, the wonderful and marvelous, where it talks about the Buddha's birth, and the Buddha is supposed to have, not the Buddha to be, his birth, uh, and he's supposed to have said that, this is my last birth. Yeah, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, this is my last birth. Uh, it's a strange statement, isn't it? I'm the best, okay. <laughs> It does. It sounds a little bit. Uh, sounds a bit strange. But also the idea that this is my last birth. Uh, this is very strange because he doesn't even know that yet. He doesn't know that there is awakening. He doesn't know that it's possible to do any of these things. Uh, so this uh, is a weird thing, and uh, this is why it is interesting to study the evolution of this whole idea of the Bodhisattva ideal. Uh, and it was studied in detail by one of my monastic colleagues, Venerable Analayo, which probably many of some of you have heard of. Uh, He's a very kind of well-known scholar these days. Uh, he's living at IMS, the Inside Meditation Society, in uh, outside Boston in the United States. Uh, that's where he's living now. Uh, and he wrote a book called The Genesis of the Bodhisattva Ideal. Genesis means like the origin, yeah, the where it comes from, uh, of the Bodhisattva Ideal. Uh. So, and in this book, he points out how this Bodhisattva idea arose from the early suttas based on little things like that, yeah? This is my last birth, uh, which already is probably has been added later on, uh, because uh, uh, if you, again, you compare the sutta with other suttas, uh, you find out that uh, uh, this, you know, some of these things are not original, including this particular idea. So, uh, this was the starting point. Uh, yeah, and then you have things like uh, in one of the other suttas, this is the, uh, 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 what is it, this one again, the uh, Dhammachakra Sa Sihanada Sutta, I think in the Diga Nikaya number 26, uh, on the wheel turning monarch, and in that sutta, uh, you have the f only mentioned in the uh, text of Maitreya Buddha, the only place that he is mentioned in all the uh, Pali Canon, uh, uh, the f early teachings uh, where Maitreya is actually mentioned, it's not mentioned anywhere else. So is that supposed to be there? And again, if you do a comparative study with other suttas, uh, it turns out that this idea probably also is a late addition. Yeah? Maitreya Buddha, there is no prediction by the Buddha. It is something that came into that sutta later on. Uh. So you can see how from nothing, uh, gradually this uh, thing, idea emerges. People are asking questions. The Buddha passed away. People are asking, who was the Buddha? Where did he come from? Will there be more Buddhas in the future? We're feeling lonely without the Buddha. Hopefully there will be more Buddhas in the future. Yeah? And then this idea gradually starts to arise. Uh, uh, the Buddha made it clear that uh, a Buddha is a natural phenomenon that arises. Occasionally you have the arising of a Buddha in the world because it's just a natural phenomenon. So eventually someone has enough wisdom, enough spiritual powers to be able to make the breakthrough to awakening. So even on reg at regular intervals you would expect a Buddha to arise in the world. Yeah, And um, uh, so from that idea that there are regular Buddhas, then they predict a specific Buddha. And that prediction of a specific Buddha is then the prediction of a Maitreya Buddha. So you can see how these things kind of evolved almost organically, almost naturally from one thing. But they take the idea much further than originally it was meant to be. In the suttas it was very simple. And then it becomes larger and larger and larger. And eventually, you know, you get this Bodhisattva ideal that you have now, both in Mahayana Buddhism, but also in Theravada Buddhism. 
It's important to realize that the Bodhisattva ideal is not just a Mahayana Buddhist idea, it also exists in Theravada Buddhism. Some of the greatest monks in Theravada Buddhism, well, some of the most famous monks anyway, they called themselves Bodhisattvas. They were practicing the Bodhisattva path. Of course, the Bodhisattva path in Theravada is not exactly the same as in Mahayana, but the idea is to become a Buddha rather than to become an Arahant. Yeah, this is kind of the purpose. But it's all very problematic because there is no path to Buddhahood. The Buddha didn't say this is the path to become a Buddha. He said there is only one path. It's called the Eightfold Path. So the whole idea of Buddhahood is kind of very problematic. Yeah? Buddhas arise more or less by accident, by chance, because there is no path. And someone is kind of blindly moving around, not really seeing what they're doing. And then by uh, almost by accident, they kind of happen on this path, and then they make the breakthrough. That's how you get Buddhas. So the idea of creating a path to Buddhahood is very problematic, especially since uh, the Buddha himself didn't actually teach such a path. It makes it very, very problematic as a consequence. So this is how these things arise, and this is why sometimes it is useful to distinguish between the early suttas uh, and later additions to the suttas. Uh, because actually you start to see that Buddhism has evolved enormously. You would expect that, wouldn't you? That everything evolves, uh, has evolved enormously over two and a half thousand years. Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons why it is so, uh, coming back to the earlier statements are, are so important. I would really recommend you, if you are interested in these things, to have a look at that booklet on the uh, genesis of the Bodhisattva ideal. Uh, uh, it's available online, you can just download it online. Uh, just um, Google on Genesis of the Bodhisattva Ideal and Analayo is the name of the monk who wrote this book. Uh, and you can, have a, you can uh, read that if you're interested. If you don't find it inspiring, f f by all means don't read it. But uh, some of you might find it interesting here. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. I, I would say that if you made a Bodhisattva vow in a past life, uh, then you made a mistake in the past life. Yeah? So if you made a mistake in the past life, don't continue that mistake in the present life. That's what I would say here. Yeah. So if you made a Bodhisattva vow in the past life, then get rid of that vow now and uh, get onto the right path. Uh, that would be my, my advice. I don't know if this monk will listen to me, but that's what I would do here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so there, that, that, that's my answer to that one. Yeah. Yes, David. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For waking, but the difference between Buddha. Where, where what's yeah. the sure. The difference between the Buddha and an Arahant. Uh, uh, the basic difference, and the Buddha actually touches on this in the suttas, uh, and it says the only difference is that he found the path, the Buddha found the path, uh, whereas the Arahant is then the, uh, the disciple who follows along the same path. Uh, that's the only distinction. And sometimes people say, is that the only distinction? And I've seen people get really upset. What do you mean? That's the only distinction. The Buddha is much better than that. Yeah, you can't, you can't just kind of put down the Buddha in that way, almost. Uh. But the point is that that is actually a fairly big distinction. Uh. And the, the reason why it is so big, if you think about, you know, uh, all of us, we're trying to follow this path. Uh, and uh, if it was really easy, we'd all be arahants by now. We're not all arahants. Uh. So it's not that easy. So actually f discovering the path uh, by fumbling around in the darkness, not knowing what it is, uh, having nothing to follow, it's pretty, actually it's pretty amazing that it's even possible to do that. Uh, when you're given the path on the plate, it's hard enough. Uh, imagine when you actually you just 
don't have no idea what you're doing basically here. Yeah. So actually it is a it is a big difference, but in terms of awakening experience, in terms of your understanding of reality, it is the same. Yeah. Just one goes first, the other one comes after here. Yeah. yeah. But actually the Buddha says that specifically in the suttas. I'm just kind of following that. Yeah. Yes, Cindy, yeah. Yeah. It has to be recorded, you see, that's why. Oh. <laughs> Go. Recorded? I think so, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it, it's okay. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Good morning, Anjan. Uh, good morning, yeah. Um, just for the sake of arguing. <laughs> yeah, but if just for the sake of arguing, do you? No, I would, I would not recommend that. If it's just for the sake of arguing, then. <laughs> okay. You yeah. mentioned about yeah. Majjhima Nikaya 1, 2, 3, that the Buddha said it was his last birth and all that. Yeah. Maybe when he was born, his mind was so clear that he knew this was his last birth, yeah. as in studies about rebirths or reincarnation. Children have vivid recollections of their previous lives. Hmm. So could it be that? Um, I I indeed, it could be. It could be that uh, that's possible. You could have a memory of having been reborn or whatever. I, I, I agree with that part of it, uh, but just because you know about rebirth doesn't necessi doesn't know that you know that you will become awakened. Those are two different things. Uh, yeah, awakening is much more than just rem remembering your past lives. Awakening is past remembering past life is part of that, uh, but it's not sufficient. So. Uh, uh, what you could say is that remembering your past life and knowing about that would be maybe a spur to reach awakening because you have an idea about suffering, so it might help you in that direction, but you still don't know that awakening is possible. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Ajahn. Yeah. In Sri Lanka, there's a story saying that there's a monk, uh, and he was traveling with three other fellow monks. And uh, the tsunami came, and they were stuck in the traffic jam. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> and um, this monk, he said, by the power of Sila, may we, you know, uh, be saved. Yeah. And when the tsunami came and hit, okay, the, there was so happened. Um, uh, there was a rock, and the car was stuck there. Uh -huh. So when the water receded, yeah. all the cars was washed off. Yeah. Okay, and the person who said this was um, actually a a um, future Buddha. It was a what? Future Buddha. Future Buddha. But future Buddha. So um, I mean, you know, it's like uh, he was a Bodhisattva, in other words. Uh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then you know, it's like when when he was being massaged and everything, all um, yeah. other people say that well, his skin feels like cotton, uh -huh. and it's so different. Um, his his okay. mere presence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just testing, just testing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Does he feel like that? <laughs> and his mere presence yeah. is so magnetic, and um, uh, he's ve he's very very wise. Uh -huh. uh, he's different. So that that could yeah. be a Buddhist all right? <laughs> <laughs> um. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, it, you know, remember these are stories that you hear, and, and stories are incredibly unreliable, extraordinarily unreliable. I hear so many stories. <laughs> I, I'll, just I'll just say a little bit. You want to add something? Or? Uh, yeah, because yeah? Yeah. Uh, me personally, when I was walking along yeah. the beach, oh. um, I've actually, uh, me, my dad, and my dad's friend, and I just enjoy walking along the beach. And I like the sky. I, 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 I love nature. Mm. So I would look at the sky and I blink my eyes and all of a sudden I saw a head. A, like a Buddha's head. Mm -hmm. It was like just looking around. After that then it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. You know, it's like um, what I heard. You know, it's like stories mm. that, oh, a uh, long, long time once it will actually come and you know, survey and everything all. I don't know who is that, but the head is pretty big, so, <laughs> you know, and it's up the sky, it's yeah. really, really big. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, and I was like, that, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I couldn't even speak. All I know is that it's so huge, and it's so, yeah. I know what I saw. Yeah. 
Uh -huh. Yeah. Is, is there a connection between this and the previous story? I don't know. Or two different ones? I, d I don't know, but, but you know, it's yeah. like, it's, um, I, I really personally, I really wish that, oh, uh. that's been, personally, I really wish that that's a Buddha to be, uh -huh. but um, I don't know, okay. This so was in Sri Lanka, or was it hi here? Here in, here in Malaysia. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, would, I would really caution people against these kind of stories because these stories are uh, very, very unreliable. Uh, and I have seen these things in my own life, how things get exaggerated and misinterpreted and people read all kinds of things into things that are uh, actually mean nothing at all. Uh, people see monks, oh, they've got psychic powers. I know they've got psychic powers. I've seen it for myself. They can read my mind. I've seen this happen so many times. And, bas and, and 19... I don't know how about how many, 90, 99% of the time or whatever, uh, it's complete nonsense. It's got nothing to do with reality. It's people projecting things onto the situation which actually isn't happening. Uh. And so it's very, it's very useful to remember that. If you see it with your own eyes, uh, then uh, it is more, uh, more reliable. Uh. But even then you have to be careful because even sometimes the things that we see with our own eyes can be mind creations. Yeah, you sit in meditation, you see the hells and the heavens, but is it real hells and heavens or is it created by your mind? Yeah, these things are very, can be very tricky. So, uh, <laughs> okay, let me just, let me just finish a little bit uh, before you. So, so, uh, uh, so I would be, I would be very kind of, uh, you know, uh, I would, I would, I tend to be skeptical uh, unless I see it. I'm, I'm not completely closed-minded. I, I have a, you know, degree of open-mindedness about these things, uh, but I tend to be skeptical because it's so easy to be wrong about these things, uh, and I see these things all the time. Uh. So, with a, a monk like that, he is very wise. But remember, wisdom in Buddhism, uh, in the end, wisdom in Buddhism means the real insight into the nature of reality. Uh. If he is a bodhisattva, he doesn't have that insight yet. Uh. So, from a Buddhist point of view, the, his wisdom is already going to be limited. Uh, yeah? Because uh, if you are a bodhisattva, if the idea is to become a future Buddha, if you have too much insight, you won't get reborn. So, you can't be a bodhisattva. So, in other words, he has, by definition, he has limited insight. Uh. So these are the things, you know, that uh, you kind of have to think about when you, when, you, when you do this. As for the Buddha head in the sky that you saw, uh, very interesting, but it could just be that your mind created that Buddha head, yeah? Uh, you just don't know. Uh, you do, is, is it your, your mental creation or was it actually a... Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> definitely not mental creation. Yeah? My mind was very clear. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's like, um, I just don't go back to my breathing while walking and just enjoying it. And suddenly I just look up the sky like, all of a sudden, yeah. it's like, huh? You know, I, mm. I am a very skeptical person. Whatever yeah. I see, I'm just like, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe something happened. But remember, it, it is also when, particularly when your mind is very clear, uh, that the mind often becomes powerful. That's often when these things can be created. You know, uh, so peop that's why people in meditation, the more peaceful you are, the closer you are to samadhi. That's when the mind becomes incredibly creative, and it can create all kind of images. And it's very hard to distinguish between what is a m pure mind creation and what is a real experience. Uh, and that can be the same thing in daily life. I've heard people seeing all things in daily life uh, and they have realized it was just a creation of their mind. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Then, Ajahn, is, could it be possible that um, in our dreams we can actually uh, dream of the future or the near future? Because yeah. uh, I've had one too many deja vus. Mm. Um, as I said, I'm a very skeptical person mm. and uh, there are far too many times that I'm like, eh, mm. I've been here before. <laughs> yeah. Eh, I've seen this situation before. Yeah. It's yeah. like, mm? no, 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 it cannot happen. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm a very skeptical person. Sure. But could this yeah. be possible? Because yeah, I think it's possible. There, there can be such a thing as clairvoyance when you see something that will happen in the future. I've heard many people having these things, uh, even people who I consider very reliable. So I think, indeed, that may be possible. Yeah. Then, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. Um, there was this instance that uh, after my uh, yeah. operation, after quite some time, many months, yeah. um, I had this dream of uh, the hell. I went to hell, yeah. but I wasn't tortured in hell. I was there to see things and yeah. to learn things. So then um, this Yaka, Yaka, who uh, the, uh, I think his name is Yaka, mm. or the you know the term because uh, they are the pe they are the he's a person that that carry out the duties, mm. not 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 like you know issuing the punishment but carrying out the duties, 
and I saw a guy, a man or a being who actually um, go through like the mincer meat, yeah. Uh -huh. So then you know it's like his feet goes in first, hmm. and I after that then his whole body then a head. He was screaming, but he cannot do anything about it. The head pool, the floor was blood. Mm. Okay, uh, hell is very dark. And then, you know, it's like Yaka said, um, when you wake up, tell people, tell people not to consume meat be mm. or sell meat because this is the result of it. You know, and this can also help you in your sickness. Uh -huh. So I'm like, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh -huh. I mean, um, it's, uh -huh. it's, <laughs> it's very vivid, okay, uh, the dream okay. is very vivid. This was a dream, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so okay. then, you know, it's like, um, yeah. but I said consume meat, okay, I said consume meat back then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As okay. I said, I was a very skeptical person. Uh, uh -huh. Consume meat, after that then, lately, um, I don't know why, uh. but my body just rejects meat. Yeah. Even the smell of it is pungent. Okay. So, um, so, okay, fine, if the body rejects it, so I just go slow with it and, and, and just you take more fetch, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, then I asked my teacher, uh, you know, it's like, is, is, is it okay for me not to consume meat, you know? Mm. Then my teacher said, yeah, it's better for your health. Uh, okay. Mm. <laughs> okay, so mm. um, could this be possible that, you know, is this dream real or what? I don't know because <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I've yeah. asked someone else. Uh, when she saw it in, in the meditation, and this person said, um, yeah, it's true. So, so are, are you saying that the, uh, the, the, this being was, uh, went through a meat grinder because of eating meat in the past? Is that the reason? Or because of uh, trading in meat? Or was it? Yaka said, uh, do yeah. not consume meat or sell yeah. meat, because this is yeah. the result of it. Okay. So yeah. I don't really no, this, per this being yeah. was as a result of consuming okay, or yeah. selling, but I know that yeah. this being got no whatsoever, uh, he all he knows is he has to suffer, okay, and okay, yeah. the it's terrible kind of suffering. I don't think, I, don't, I, I doubt very much it was a result of consuming meat, because uh, even the Buddha uh, consumed meat, uh, yeah, this was kind of common from the very beginning. So, uh, and there is no rule anywhere really that consuming meat, or the Buddha never says it's even bad karma to consume meat. Uh, so it's kind of one of those questions, is it bad karma in a very slight extent or not? It's really hard to answer that question. But it's not uh, an issue that is very important, otherwise it would have been laid down as a rule uh, for the, you know, for people. Uh, so, but uh, again, I, you know, I think that there is a very lot of good reasons for being a vegetarian, and if people want to be vegetarian, I think it's wonderful. Huh? And it's good for the climate, yeah, because there is an enormous amounts of climate gases being kind of, uh, you know, let out because of meat production. And there's obviously, you know, in the end, if we have vegetarian, it, it's easier to combine that with compassion for animals and all these things. I think there are lots of good reasons for that, and health reason is another one. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly respect that. And I, most of the time I try to be vegetarian myself, uh, but I'm also pretty flexible. Uh, I'm kind of flexitarian, uh, yeah? So, <laughs> but I tend to be vegetarian. Uh. So, uh, so I think, uh, personally, I, I think it's great. And, but that dream, remember, it's just a dream. It's very hard to pinpoint anything exactly. And uh, even if it was a yakka, you know, how much wisdom does do these yakkas actually have, you know? You have no idea about these things. Uh, so I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that. I would just use your common sense now. And if it feels right for you not, not to eat meat, then of course, go, go for it. That's what I would follow, rather than following the dream uh, as such. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, let us continue with the sutta. Otherwise, we're going to be here all day just discussing all these in fascinating stories, but uh, <laughs> we're going to take, take a long time. So, <coughs> okay, so we only got to the first sentence so far uh, of the sutta. <laughs> it's kind of a bad sign, isn't it? So, uh, uh, this is basically the idea of the Bodhisattva in the early suttas. Uh, it is very different from what it became later on. Uh, and then the Buddha says, or the Buddha, uh, to be, uh, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. Uh, then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. Uh, and I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. Uh, 
And then uh, it says in the next sentence, it says, as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute. So I will stop there. Um, and so this is the first thing that I always found interesting when I started reading the sutta, is that uh, if you look here at the definition of diligent, ardent, and resolute, uh, it is defined as dividing your thoughts into two classes. Uh, that is what it means to be diligent, ardent, and resolute. Uh, isn't that kind of fascinating? Uh, yeah, because diligent here is uh, apamada, yeah, it means like being heedful, so being careful, being circumspect about what you're doing. Ardent is atapi. Atapi is a word that is used in the suttas, which means similar to padana or vayama, putting forth effort. Yeah? This is kind of the idea of atapi, yeah, very similar to these things. And pahitatta is resolute, and pahitatta is a word that is related to pad padana again. Padana meaning right effort or meaning effort. So all of these things kind of imply you're making an effort, uh, you're being careful, you're being heedful, you're being circumspect about what you're doing. Uh, and what does that putting forth effort mean in this case? Uh, the right kind of effort, the wise effort, it means dividing your thinking into two classes. Uh, that's what it means. Uh. Now this is kind of this is in very interesting because it's very counterintuitive. Uh. Usually, when we think about putting forth effort, we think about controlling the mind, controlling my actions. Uh, yeah, using using the willpower to some extent. Uh. Yeah, I use my willpower to make sure I act in the right way. Uh. I, con I hold back uh, at the right time, uh, and I act at the right time. Uh. And there is some degree of that, some degree to which that is correct. Uh, part of right effort is about knowing the right time to do the right thing, holding back when you're not supposed to do something. It's a little bit of right effort in that. But what this is saying uh, is that right effort uh, is about wisdom. Yeah, Dividing your thinking into two classes is the wisdom aspect. Uh, because you understand that the uh, there are certain thoughts worth thinking, certain thoughts not worth thinking, uh, and so you actually divide the world, your mental world, into those two aspects. This is all about wisdom power. Uh, and this is one of those things that is, to me, was always so uh, <coughs> fascinating about the suttas. Uh, and again, it is something that uh, 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 <coughs> fitted very well with the way Ajahn Brahm always taught the Buddhist path. Uh, willpower is not the way, it is wisdom power that is the way. Uh, and this is really showing exactly that. You're using your wisdom. Huh? And uh, I will tell you later on why this is so important and why it is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the reasons, very simply, is because wisdom is a far more powerful tool than willpower. Huh? Far more effective tool. Huh? <coughs> the only problem with it is that you have to develop it. Yeah? You may not have it yet. Huh? That's the only kind of negative or the hard side huh? with it. Huh? You have to develop it. But once it's there, it is incredibly effective. Huh? So this is what comes out of this, uh, and uh, I, it's always nice when kind of your teacher, like in this case Ajahn Brahm, fits with the word of the Buddha, that's when I feel really kind of, I feel a bit, it's, it's like a relief, yeah, because you know that these things are very likely then to be, be correct, everything is fitting, fitting nicely together. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> this is the first thing, this is the meaning of uh, uh, being heedful, or being uh, energetic and striving, uh, this idea of being wise, using wisdom power rather than willpower. Uh. And um, as I mentioned yesterday, there is a very nice little sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 2 uh, that talks about two different kinds of powers, the power of development and the power of reflection. And the power of development is all about getting into de very deep meditation. But to get rid of the hindrances, uh, to get rid of the defilements of the mind, to get rid of the problems, uh, power of reflection is what you use. Uh, specifically, the Sutta specifically says that uh, overcoming hindrances, overcoming problems is all about reflection, uh, reflecting in the right way, thinking about things in the right way. Uh, and uh, maybe you think, w how, you know, how to do this? And this is exactly what we're going to have a look at now, today and tomorrow, is how to reflect in the right way so as to overcome these problems. Uh, and when you, it's going to be fairly obvious, the things I say, uh, but it's strange how things that are fairly obvious are not kind of generally understood by people. Yeah, things that we, I've, I've been talking about all along, uh, how things in the external world are impermanent. Uh, everybody knows that, uh, but nobody really knows it in a very deep sense. Uh, so this is why reflection like this, uh, 
even though it is obvious in one way, uh, it is also something we need to do more of, to internalize it, to make it go deeper, so it becomes a power in our life, and then it becomes the patisankana bala, the power of reflection, rather than just being a superficial thing that we don't really heed uh, properly in our ordinary life. So, so wisdom power is just uh, a habit almost, yeah? it, we can call it wisdom, but just a habit of thinking here. Uh, it's our ordinary habit of thinking is deluded very often. Uh, it is not wise. Uh, so we change our habit, we learn to think in another way, uh, and that is what is called wisdom. Uh. So it is not, it's not, not as difficult as it may sound. Uh, yeah? It is just about uh, looking at things in a slightly different way. So the first thing then is this idea of dividing your thoughts into two groups, two categories. Uh. On one side you have all the thoughts that are negative, that are, have negative, that don't help you on the path, uh, sensual desire, ill will. Uh, I should say straight away that ill will is far more problematic than sensual desire. So I would uh, recommend you to focus mostly on the ill will part, uh, because that is really the problematic one. Uh, uh, this And the Buddha says so in the suttas, uh, ill will is much more to blame. Yeah, It creates much more problems, much more bad karma, it ends up creating disharmony, all kind of problems uh, because of ill will. Sensuality, and also the good thing about ill will, it's eas easy to get rid of. Uh. That's what the Buddha says. Uh. Yeah, so you, I don't know what you think about that. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure many of you here haven't got all that much ill will, but still, whatever is there in your mind, uh, yeah, it's, is it easy to get rid of? Uh? And you may think that the Buddha must be joking. What do you mean it's easy to get rid of? I, you know, if it was easy, it wouldn't have, any, have it anymore. Uh. So, but uh, it is still relatively easy. It is just about applying your mind in the right way here. Yeah? And we will have a look at that later on. Uh. And if you do it in the right way, everyone, everyone is, is capable of reducing the amount of upset and ill will that we have in our lives. Uh. So focus on that one. Sensuality is more difficult because uh, sensuality is like, uh, it's hard to see the problem with sensuality. Yeah, we're just enjoying ourselves, having a good time, enjoying the pleasures of life. and. And uh, there is some truth to that, and that is why it is much more difficult, so it, it takes more insight. But nevertheless, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of look at ways of dealing with that uh, in a kind of very broad context. I've already talked about this quite a lot already since I came here to Malaysia, because I think it is, a very, imp it is very important in some ways, uh, remembering how the external world is going to let you down, this kind of things, uh, that is actually helping you to reduce sensuality and attachment to the world of the five senses already. Uh, but the focus should really be on ill will, that is where the problem arises, the main problems. Uh. But then there is this last category here, which is here called thoughts of cruelty. Uh. This is vihingsa or hingsa in Pali. Uh. And what exactly does this mean? And uh, a cruelty is not really a very good translation of this, because uh, cruelty is a kind of very harsh thing, yeah? It's like you're enjoying to torture others, or enjoying kind of killing beings, or whatever, that's kind of cruelty. And sure, there are, pe sure, there are beings like that, there are people like that who enjoy that, but it's pretty rare, yeah, yeah that you enjoy kind of killing and torturing other beings. Uh. So what this term means uh, in uh, uh, in, uh, more likely is that it means lo like harming, uh, yeah? It means that you harm other beings and you haven't got the uh, consideration to consider uh, uh, or to reflect on how your actions actually affect other beings and other people. Uh. This is part of the problem. So it's like almost like being inconsiderate. Uh. It's like being cold-hearted, yeah? It's the opposite of compassion. Compassion is that you care how your actions affect other beings and animals uh, and, and whatever else. Uh. This is lack of care. This is what harming means, of being inconsiderate, cold-hearted, yeah? You are like, you know, you, you need to get things done. Uh. For example, in your ordinary life, you are a business person, you've got to get business done. And if it kind of harms other people, well, tough luck for those other people, they're going to have to look after themselves, yeah? Uh, and if they kind of, uh, whatever happens to them, that's none of your business. And it's interesting, that kind of cold-heartedness, not caring for others, uh, even though you haven't got ill will, uh, is a negative kind of mental state, uh, yeah? Which is kind of fascinating, because not something that we normally think about. Uh, so when you, that lack of care for others actually is a problem, uh, which uh, 
uh, yeah, so which doesn't really come out when you use the term cruelty. So cruelty is not really appropriate in this case. Uh, and on the other side of the equation, uh, yeah, so these are all the things that block you on the path and cause bad karma and cause problems. Uh, on the other side of the equation, you have all the good thoughts, uh, which are the thought of non-desire. Renunciation is nekama. Yeah, it, it literally means non-desire, uh, giving up of desire. And this desire that this refers to is the desire in the realm of the five senses specifically. Huh? This is kind of the desire we're talking about here. Huh? And then you have the thought of non-ill will, uh, which you can say that is like metta practice, but non-ill will is a bit broader than metta, but roughly it means metta. It means friendliness, it means kindness, loving kindness if you like. Uh, all of this is part of that. Uh. And then non-cruelty, the uh, 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 what that means is basically compassion. So cruelty here is uh, can be one of the ways to translate that. It's like being ruthless. Yeah, when you are ruthless, it means that you don't care about the uh, what happens to other people. Uh, yeah, other people, whatever you know. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, being non-cruelty is the opposite of that. It means having Ruth. Uh, have you got Ruth? Yeah. <laughs> Ruth in English the, the is, is a name, yeah? people are called Ruth, uh, but the, the, the root meaning of the word Ruth is compassion. Huh? That's what it actually means. Uh. So Ruth, and this is an, an, an ancient English word, is to be ruthful. Huh? It's the opposite of ruthless. If you are lack, lacking in Ruth, you're lacking compassion, but you are, you are ruthful, you're full of compassion. This is kind of what ruthful actually, this is an ancient word used back in the 17th century apparently in England. I had to research this obviously, I, I had no idea this was the case, but uh, this is what you find out. Uh. So that you can uh, add that word in there. So non-cruelty, ruthfulness. Uh, and people will wonder what you're talking about when you, when you say that. Uh. <laughs> so this is dividing the world up into two classes. And you may think, in one way, it is obvious yeah, that you should divide the world up in w this way. And it's so obvious that some of these thoughts are going to be a hindrance, other ones are going to be supportive. Uh, but actually, it is quite difficult to do this fully. Uh. It is obvious in, in terms of the thoughts that are very strong. You know, you feel ill will, you feel angry, or you feel, uh, uh, you know, strong desires or whatever it is. Uh, it's obvious what, that, what this means. Uh, but remember, these things can be very subtle, very, very subtle desires, yeah? The mind is a little bit restless in your meditation, moving a little bit. Uh, why is that? Because there's some subtle desire. You don't even know what the desire is sometimes. Uh, you can't pinpoint it. It's somehow related to the body, somehow related to something, but you can't really say it. Uh. So the idea of being able to do this fully, fully divide your entire mental universe into these categories, actually, it is very profound. Uh. And this is why that you find in things like the Satipatthana Sutta, the whole last category, the Dhamma Nupassana of the Satipatthana Sutta, is focused specifically on understanding the defilements, yeah? understanding what they are, how they arise, how they don't arise in the future. It is the very last thing you do before you enter the jhanas, because you are here, out on a limb, you're in a territory um, uh, that is very... Un uh, there are mind states that are very unusual, very hard to actually understand and see. So you need to investigate that with great care. And that is what the last Satipatthana is about. Uh, can, uh, can, would you mind writing it down? Uh, uh, what should I call it? Cindy or Julie? What, what is your usual name that you go by here? Cindy, okay. Would you mind writing it down? Because I'm running out of time a little bit. If I take too many questions, we are going to be here. We're going to have to have add another week for the retreat. Uh, so, uh, so maybe write it down and I, I'll answer this evening here. Uh. You okay with that? Uh, yeah? Great. Okay. So uh, it is actually not as obvious as it may seem. And this is one of the reasons why wisdom power is, uh, you know, viewing the world in a new way, understanding things in a new way that you haven't really understood for, uh, before. Uh, so, uh, as I abided thus, uh, heedful, yeah, with energy and uh, with effort, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. Uh, and then the same thing is repeated for a thought of ill will and a thought of uh, ruthlessness. So this, when you say a thought of sensual desire, it means a thought that is imbued with that, yeah, that has that characteristic with it. Uh, it's a little bit strange, a thought of sensual desire, as if the whole, you know, a thought of ill will, it means the thought is imbued with these characteristics. It is a part of the thought, not necessarily the whole thought. So, uh, 
Uh, so when this happened, I understood thus. Uh, this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. Uh, yeah, this is the first thing. And again, this is not obvious, uh, because it need means that you have to have a full understanding of the whole sensual realm to be able to really understand the limits of sensual desire. It can be very, very subtle, because the five senses can be extremely subtle. Yeah, like for example, I give you an example of sensual desire, which may not seem very obvious at all. You are in deep meditation, all your senses are fading away, all that is left is a little bit of hearing, yeah, and you can't let go of the hearing, yeah, because it's like you are fr frightened. Once you let go of the hearing, as, as if you lose your sense of the, your ordinary world, yeah, and that can be scary. Yeah. We are so immersed in the five senses that letting go of that actually is quite hard. That is sensual desire. Yeah, you can see how refined that is and how it doesn't really come under our normal understanding of what sensual desire is. But that is part of what it is according to the Dhamma to enable you to go into deep samadhi. And this is one of the big prob biggest problems for samadhi is that we have to be able to let go of our ordinary world. The world of the five senses which we are so immersed in which is so kind of everything we are is pretty much this five sense world. So to let go of that is a uh, uh, unsettling here, uh, even though it is a wonderful thing to do, even though it gives the most marvelous results, uh, it is still a bit scary initially. Uh, and that this is why what we have to kind of understand and sort out. Uh. So, this is what uh, makes the Buddha special. He's able to do this on his own. Yeah, he's able to see these things uh, and he understands sensual desire. So, this is the first thing. This is already hard enough. It is uh, not so hard when it comes to the course thoughts uh, yeah so we start with those uh, and then as we kind of learn to overcome the coarser aspect of the hindrances then we go to the more refined ones uh, and gradually 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 we move to the really refined things uh, and uh, so this is how this process works this is explained in a sutta in the anguttara nikaya called the gold refiner sutta or the or the dirt washer or something like that uh, anguttara nikaya 3 is 101 i think it is uh, yes thank you <laughs> okay so uh, uh, and uh, so there it explains you how you purify the mind in stages gradually, starting with the courses, uh, ending up with the very refined uh, problems of the mind. Uh, so um, uh, then, then what you do? And the next thing that you do here, the Buddha says, uh, is you understand this leads to my own affliction. Affliction is like suffering, basically. Yeah? Leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, uh, to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, it causes difficulties, it leads away from Nibbana. When I considered in this way, this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, or ill will, or whatever, one of these three, I abandoned it, uh, removed it, uh, did away with it. So uh, again, this is interesting, because uh, this is how the Buddha overcomes these negative thoughts. Uh, here he gives the method for how to overcome negative thoughts. Uh, and of course the point here is that we should b do things in a similar kind of way. That's kind of the point of this. Uh, so all you have to do is to remember that it leads to your own affliction. Uh, if you understand that it leads to your own suffering, uh, he says here, it will subside in you. Uh. So why doesn't that happen? Yeah, you may think that you know that ill will is going to be problematic. Uh, yeah, it, it leads to all kinds of problems, it's kind of obvious. Uh, but the point is, you don't understand it fully enough. Uh. If you really understood it fully, you wouldn't go there anymore. Uh. You would stay away from that. Uh. It is like, uh, you know, if you pick up a hot piece of something, a coal by accident, you don't know what it is, uh, it's really, really hot, and you, oh, you know, it's hot. Uh, you don't have to think, should I let go or not? Uh, it's, it happens automatically, just kind of straight away, you reject it. Uh, you touch something which is uh, hot, like a hot plate by accident, uh, you don't have to think, oh, should I remove my hand or should I not? Hmm. If you think like that, it will already be too late. Uh, yeah? You will already burn it out. It's like the mind automatically rejects that without even thinking. It's an automatic thing. Uh, in exactly the same way, if you fully understand the problem with these thoughts, uh, you would just withdraw from them, you wouldn't even go there. Uh. 
So the fact that we still get a bit upset about things, we still get angry, means we haven't fully understood how problematic they are. Uh. So for this reason, it's useful to think about that. Uh, yeah, it's useful to kind of understand this. And part of this, we are here talking about sensual desire. Why is it that sensual desire leads to so many problems? And uh, to give you some answer to this question, and uh, again, you, you really need to, the more you kind of pull out of these things, the more you kind of, if you go on retreat one day, you know, get some nice meditation, you get far more perspective on these things. Uh, but to give you a little bit of perspective, and we'll talk about this more later on, uh, is uh, that one of the problems of the sensual pleasures of the world is that it always leads to conflict. Uh, yeah, so whenever, and the reason it leads to conflict is because sensual things are external to us. Uh, the world that satisfy our senses are always outside, uh, so we're always competing with others about these things. Uh, we're competing for the job promotion, we keep competing for the same partner in life. Uh, yeah, this is always like that. Uh, b we tend to like the same people, uh, and this causes problems. Uh, we are competing for, uh, you know, that salary increase in our job, uh, or sometimes we are just competing for you know, more directly for things. Uh, I'm very glad you're not competing for me for this juice because uh, then we have a problem. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for having that kind of wisdom. Uh, but sometimes you compete for the food. Yeah, there's only so much food there. And you think, I would like that food, and somebody else takes it before you. You see children fighting over the toys, or whatever it is. Uh, people fighting over the inheritance. Uh, yeah, we sensual pleasures are inherently problematic. They inherently lead to conflict, to violence, and to uh, lack of harmony in our society. Uh, and once you get that, that this is what the sensual world is like, it becomes far less attractive. It's not because you know that when you enjoy this, it's not just enjoyment, just behind the enjoyment, waits the conflict, waits the problem. And this is part or parcel of this whole idea that the sensual world is inherently unsatisfactory because it always lets you down in the end. In the end, you're going to have to die. Someone else is going to have to die here. The things that you like in this world are going to be taken away from you. It always ends up problematically in one way or another. So this is why. But the, so this is kind of the beginning of understanding the limits of the sensual world and the five senses. Uh, but it goes much deeper than that. Uh, that sounds bad enough already. Uh, yeah, and if you think like that, you learn how to kind of move in a different direction. But it goes much deeper. Uh, and the reason why it goes deeper, and this is where the idea of right view yeah, really starts to come in. Remember the Buddha says one of the important aspects of right view is the idea of rebirth uh, and kamma. Yeah, this is so important because only then do you get a full grasp of what suffering is about. Uh, now what is the thing that ties you to rebirth more than anything else? Uh, sensuality. Uh, yeah, this is the most important thing that ties us to the round of rebirth. Uh, if you can overcome sensuality, you have done 90% of the work with getting yourself out of samsara. This is the really hard part, because uh, we are so immersed in it. Uh, and this is what drives you on from life to life. And one of the reasons for that is because the sensual world is very closely connected with craving and desire. Always craving, moving on to something else, moving, going somewhere more, never being fully satisfied with what you have already driving you on, driving you on, from life to life to life. It ties you down, shackles you down, glues you to samsara. This is what sensuality does. Uh. And this is one of the reasons why in the monastic life we have such st uh, strong rules against, uh, you know, especially against relationships. That's why you don't have relationships as a monastic. Uh, yeah, the idea is you uh, kind of, you are forced to restrain a little bit in that area so that you kind of uh, unshackle some of the things that uh, otherwise ties you down to samsaric existence. Uh. So this is what this, uh, this is the big problem with sensuality. Uh. Once you get out of sens sensuality, then all that really remains is that you have attachment to existence. Uh. You still want to live, uh. you still want to uh, exist as a being. That is a fairly weak fetter compared to sensuality. Sensuality is a very strong and very sticky thing uh, in the world. Uh. So this gives you some degree of idea of why this is problematic. But again, far more important than focusing on sensuality is focusing on ill will. Ill will is much more problematic. Yeah. So um, it leads to your own affliction. This is why it leads to others' affliction as well. Because when we are part of the sensual world, it leads to conflict. Uh, yeah, conflict with other people. There's a problem for them, uh, uh, and it leads to the affliction of both. 
Why does it say even say that? Uh, and the, the reason why it says that is because sometimes we think, oh, it's only the other person that suffers, I don't suffer, so yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> or we may think, oh, it's only me, that you may kind of be more the martyr kind of person, it's only me that suffers, not the other people, so it's okay. But actually, no, it's always bad for both at the same time. Uh, yeah, everyone suffers as a consequence of, of these things. Uh, and this is why it is problematic. Yeah. So one of the nice things about the spiritual path that, uh, you know, is, is to think about the spiritual path as those things that are good both for you and for other people. It's a very nice way of thinking about uh, spirituality. Uh, whenever you do something that's both good for you and others, uh, then you know it is a real Buddhist uh, and a real spiritual thing that you are, you are doing. Uh. So this is one way of uh, thinking about that. Uh. And then uh, it says that uh, um, it uh, obstructs wisdom. Uh. Yeah, uh, another very important idea that if you uh, engage too much in ill will, certainly, and also in sensuality, it obstructs your ability to see things clearly. Uh, and the obvious, the reason for that is because whenever there you are have an interest in the sensual world, you have a vested interest in the thing that you have uh, a sensual desire or attachment to. Uh, yeah, you have a vested interest in your belongings, uh, in your apartment or your house. Uh, you have a vested interest in that. If some burglar comes and says, I'm going to take your things away, uh, what do you say? Do you say, yes, please, just go ahead? Or do you say, no, thank you, I'd rather not? Uh, usually you say, no, thank you, go away. Yeah, you, you can't burgle my house, go somewhere. Don't go, <laughs> go somewhere else. <laughs> I'm not sure if that is the right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Find another job. Yeah, burgling is no good. It's a bad job to be a burglar. So find, <laughs> find another job. So, uh, and uh, so this is the uh, uh, so, so so this is the thing. Yeah, that's what that's what you, what I mean by vested interest. You don't want these things to happen, uh, and uh, because of that, because we have a vested interest in things, we can't see them clearly. Uh, you can't see clearly if you look at someone else's possessions. Okay, it's very different. Uh, if you look at your own, you can't see things with clarity. Uh, your mind is already biased, and because the bias is there, it's impossible to have real wisdom about it. Uh, and this is the problem. It obstructs wisdom. Uh, and the Pali word here is actually not just obstructs. Uh, the Pali word is panya nirodika. Nirodika means cease. It makes wisdom cease. And it's kind of terrible, isn't it? Because wisdom, I don't know about you, but to me wisdom is such an extraordinarily beautiful word. Uh, what doesn't everybody want to be wise? What does it mean to be wise? It means that you have the ability to run your life in a good way. You have the ability to create happiness for yourself and others. Uh, there's something very beautiful and lofty and noble about wisdom. Uh, it's a very noble quality. Uh, and anyone it, with common sense, we want to be wise. Uh, so if this destroys wisdom, uh, it's got to be pretty bad. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty terrible. Uh, so this is kind of enough reason straight away to overcome sensuality. Yeah. Then we have it causes difficulties, uh, agata, which just means that it is, uh, it is connected with suffering. Yeah, again, uh, connected with suffering, it causes difficulties of all kinds and, and uh, blocks you and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and it leads away from Nibbana. Leads away from Nibbana. What is Nibbana? Nibbana is, uh, can be translated as extinguishment. Uh, in these days, I like to translate Nibbana rather than just leaving it as Nibbana because if you leave the Pali word, people read anything they want into it. Nibbana, yeah, Nibbana means this, means that. If you translate it as extinguishment, much less, much more difficult to read whatever you want into it. Uh, so I think it's actually useful to translate these words. Uh, in ancient India, Nibbana would have a meaning. Yeah, it meant something to people. To us, it means nothing. Nibbana, sure, do you know what it means? Yeah, it means, yeah, bliss, yeah, happiness. Uh, yeah, kind of the best place to hang out, that's Nibbana. Uh, are you sure you're going to hang out there? Maybe not even going to hang out there. Yeah, maybe, that's a, maybe that's, a, that's a misunderstanding. That's what I mean, you read anything you want into it. Uh, so, and this is before the Buddha's awakening. Uh, so he didn't really know what Nibbana meant at this stage either. Uh, so, but you think, if you think about it as extinguishment, uh, then actually it's quite nice. Uh, because gradually you are extinguishing the problems inside of you. Yeah? You are extinguishing the greed, the, the anger, and all of these flames that burn us all the time. Uh, these things are gradually getting extinguished. Uh, so extinguishing all the problems in the world, uh, making those fade away, uh, make becoming more cool. You want to be a cool person? Uh, everybody wants to be cool, yeah? <laughs> This is the double meaning of cool. Uh, you don't have to wear kind of cool sunglasses, anything like that. Uh, you all you have to become is have a cool heart. Uh, and one of the nice epithets for someone who is awakened in the suttas, the arahant, is Siti Bhutto. 
See, the Buddha means the cool one there. <laughs> Quite nice, yeah. So Arahant, oh, they're really cool people there. But cool in the inner sense of the fires being extinguished uh, and being kind of relaxed at ease. Cool in that sense. Uh. So if it moves you away from the becoming more cool, uh, it's got to be bad. Yeah, ask any youngster. Uh, being non non cool is kind of bad. Uh. So if it moves you away from that to being at ease, being relaxed, having equanimity, having less defilements in the mind, obviously it's going to be bad. Uh. The less you have of these things, uh, it's going to be good. Uh. So think about Nibbana in that way. Think about Nibbana as what happens in your meditation practice. Uh, when you sit down, uh, uh, you become more at ease, you become more relaxed, uh, things are cooling down. Uh, yeah? There's less thoughts, less things happening. That is what extinguishment means. Uh, and then you understand, actually, extinguishment is blooming marvelous. Yeah? It's really nice. Uh, wow, I feel more extinguished. Uh, you're closer to Nibbana when you are more peaceful and when you're more at ease. Uh, this is the path to Nibbana, the highway. You already have some idea what it means uh, when you start to have results in a meditation practice. Uh. So Nibbana is good. Uh, even if you don't really know what it means in the final sense, uh, you can have some idea what it means by thinking about it in this way. Uh. Okay, I better stop there because uh, we have already gone uh, past the hour. So let's have another break, 15 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll come back and then we'll do some uh, meditation together afterwards. Uh. Brothers and sisters and Dhamma, we are, I mean, we still have a lot of pages to cover. Achan still has another 10 pages of Sutta. So kindly refrain the questions. I mean, kindly uh, confine the questions to within the Sutta materials. Any other questions, please write in the Q&A. Okay, there, there are Q&A sessions at the end of the day at 4, four o'clock. So uh, please don't bring in personal stories or other things. We, we don't have time.